Before The Lost World came out in 1997, and the novel it was adapted from hit shelves two years earlier, a totally different Jurassic Park story was told. Recently, I've completed the full overview and an analyzation of the events depicted in the Jurassic Park Raptor comics series. I promised to give my final thoughts on the series and review it as a whole after I did each issue individually, and felt that it was a story deserving as such as well as one that would be cool to rank up against other Jurassic material and be a proper send-off to this really interesting part of the entire franchise. Now, this series was made literally immediately after the release of Jurassic Park, and the first issue was actually released before the movie even hit VHS back in October of 1994. Because of this, the story in this series takes place directly after the events of the first film, and the run keeps Alan, Ellie, Malcolm, and Hammond involved in the aftermath of Jurassic Park instead of splitting them up like the film sequels eventually did. Now, this story actually has the notoriety of technically being the first sequel to Jurassic Park, as even Michael Crichton's sequel novel, The Lost World, wouldn't come out until 1995. That being said, it is definitely not as high quality, in my opinion, as the stories in The Lost World's book and film version, or Jurassic World for that matter. Now, I actually do prefer this to the story we got in Jurassic Park 3, but my opinions on this part of the Jurassic Park legacy is limited to its constraints within a comic book form. And honestly, I do believe it would have been a very successful sequel if it was given a film treatment. The oddest thing about this whole story for me seemed to be the lack of any other dinosaurs other than the Velociraptors that were featured throughout it. I know it's called Raptor and Raptor's Attack and Hijack and so on, but I really find it rather intriguing that they chose to immediately take the story off of the island and instead feature an adventure in South America following the escaped dinosaurs who were causing all kinds of terror and panic everywhere they went. This story also showcased a lot of human error and thinking these raptors can be controlled by the likes of a Colombian drug lord and rival genetics company agent in both Raphael Santos and Dr. Fisher. Raphael was a very odd choice of a villain in my opinion, as the portrayal of a drug king in the middle of the rainforest using the raptors as attack hounds was really corny to me. It constantly reminded me of License to Kill, in which James Bond has to take on cocaine manufacturers who have used a great white shark to maim his CIA friend Felix Leiter. And while I really enjoyed that 007 film, I really thought that doing this in a Jurassic Park setting was kind of taking a big step down from the normal scope of how grand these stories can be when told from the perspective of good intentions being muddled with bad ethics. And the ethical implications themselves seemed absent in all of this. Raphael did exhibit the same faults that all of the Jurassic Park stories try to symbolize, as man's control of nature being something that shouldn't be treated lightly, and genetic powers usage and consequences resulting in the unpredictability of future situations, as well as the hubris and folly of man being put on full display from the unworldly tampering with these things. But, in all honesty, the attraction of a dinosaur theme park is far more compelling than one of a petty drug lord trying to kill his enemies. Now, Dr. Fisher, on the other hand, is shown to be the very archetype of Jurassic Park villain. He's someone who's been disgruntled or gotten upset over the company's treatment with him, and goes to Engine's rival in an attempt to better himself and climb the ladder higher with his own ambition directly echoing Hammond's and Jurassic Park's as a whole in terms of self-confidence and innovation. This, of course, backfires on Fisher, just as we've seen it backfire on Dennis Nedry, Peter Ludlow, and even Simon and Mizrani. Malcolm's famous lesson on ethical behavior that he preaches to Hammond was constantly in my head during his scenes. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Dinosaurs and man are two species that have suddenly been thrown back into the mix together in this continuing story from the first film, and it's interesting to see how immediate the resulting consequences are for the humans now living with superior life forms on the same planet. The constant exploitation and pursuit of these animals by Biosyn and hunters like George Lawala was very entertaining and one of the things I've always admired most about this franchise. Now bringing Muldoon back was a move that I thought paid off really well for this story and seeing him go Captain Ahab against the Raptors was really fun. Robert Muldoon was a character that actually lived in Michael Crichton's original book and he's one of my favorite characters from the original movie. So seeing him make his return and devoting himself to hunting the Raptors was really cool. Now, Malcolm's constant flirting and romantic advances made on Dr. Sattler were actually something I didn't expect at all. And when it finally leads into the two kissing in the final issue, I was actually shocked. That is something I never thought I would see happen, and it didn't even occur to me to even be a possibility after Ian became aware of Grant and Sattler's relationship during the middle of Jurassic Park. It's so weird to see where these old stories lead after having seen The Lost World and Jurassic Park 3. 
Now, of course, the run also introduced us to several ideas that would later become used in Jurassic World, albeit quite differently from what is shown here. However, I think it's important to note that both instances are the only known times that velociraptors are given names in the franchise, outside of Lex naming the baby raptor Clarence in Crichton's first book. Betty, Alf, and Celia go on a long and wild adventure throughout the Amazon, dodging containment by humans like Santos and running from hunters like Llewellyn Muldoon, and the raptors themselves become somewhat of their own characters, similar to Delta, Charlie, Echo, and Blue in Jurassic World. Being as big of a Jurassic nut as I am, I saw the inbreeding between siblings Celia and Alf early on in the plot, once Betty had been killed as the only way that this species would survive. And what is Jurassic Park's most essential message if not that life will find a way? The overall narrative leading to South America is actually one taken from the ending of the original novel, where it's shown that animals have been destroying lysine enriched crops and making paths throughout the mainland, basically hinting that the dinosaurs have indeed migrated off of Nublar and are thriving in the wilds now alongside man. This is an idea that I am confident we will see in a future movie, and one that I can't wait to see on the big screen, but kudos for Raptor Comics for tackling it first. Dr. Belvedere was probably my second favorite of the new characters created for this run, behind George Lawala, and even though her death surprised me at the end of the story, and was unexpected to a few of you as well, I have to say I was quite satisfied with it. Her death by the Raptors is the very embodiment of what this franchise has always warned its audience about, and the chaos that ensues once mankind thinks control over the species we've brought back from the grave as possible is really poetic and something I think every Jurassic Park fan can identify with. The issue that harkened back to King Kong with a gorilla fighting two velociraptors reminded me heavily of the lost world and all the subtext and visual representations seen in the second Jurassic Park film to its dinosaur movie predecessors, and it was a fun departure from the usual hunt for the raptors that was going on throughout the whole run. All in all, I thoroughly enjoyed this comic series, and although it isn't quite as good as some of the other Jurassic Park stories told in films, games, and books, I do really think it's well made, and one that I guarantee would have been successful if turned into a film. The only issue I believe audiences would take with it is the lack of other dinosaurs to see outside of the rare Tyrannosaur, and children would likely frequent this outing less than the first. It also may not have received as high praise due to its drug lord villain being more copy and paste than usual Jurassic Park baddies are, but hey, who knows. I enjoyed this series and hope you all did too. Personally, this is how I think the series holds up in terms of issue to issue, and these are my final thoughts on the run. Now, I hope you all enjoyed this discussion and review of the series overall. And if you did, I'd appreciate it if you left me a like. I'm curious to hear what you all would rank the series as issue to issue, like I've done here, and how good you think the comics were compared to the other stories we've seen as an initial sequel to Jurassic Park. I look forward to reading your comments very soon and want to thank you again for taking the time to watch this video. As always guys, take it easy.